this week we're going to go over lung simulation. We're actually going to go over lung and mantle simulation because there are a lot of similarities. Kind of pile them in together because of that. Now, I will cover a lung simulation, and then I'm going to go backwards and show you what's different about a mantle simulation. Both of them require you to treat the chest. We're going to assume a relatively large lung field, and we're going to assume that, of course, we're not doing a CT and we need to give the dosimetrist information that they wouldn't otherwise have. So, in the old days, we would treat big old lung fields. We didn't have any CT information, so we had to be able to extract certain information from this field that we wouldn't otherwise have because old calculations usually gave you a dose of CR and nothing else. But with the lung, as we talked about in class, you have varying depths of tissue. You have a small separation at the superior edge and a relatively large separation at the inferior edge. You have the spinal cord to deal with. That's the most important thing to really consider when you're treating the lung is the spine because you're going to treat the lung to a higher dose than the spinal cord can take. So you always want to be aware of that. Since the spine sits at different depths along in here, you're going to have to have dose points for that as well. All that dose point does is give you information about the treatment field at particular points other than the CR. Either way, if it's a lung sim, we're going to get the arms up. You're going to have them on a wing board or some other device to get the arms up out of the way. It's going to lock them in place. It's going to make the setup more reproducible and more stable than if their arms were at their sides. We we'll discuss all that. We won't go over that again. Let's assume her arms are up instead of gone. You, we're going to center for the, at the in the middle of the chest for this particular setup in this particular example. Get the patient straight when you lay them down on the table. Always get the patient's arms up. Get them in a position where they can comfortably hold that position and be reproducible. Let's assume we have that done. Now we're just going to center in the middle of her chest for this particular example, so I can show you several of those points. We're going to take her up to about midline. Now we have kind of a big field set here. We're going to make it even larger. All right. So what we've got is a relatively large field. We've set it to basically kind of mid-plane, up, down. We've set it mid-plane, left, right, just for a nice starting point in this particular example. We're just going to treat, treat her as like a, a primary mediastinal cancer. Once you've got that set, you're going to go ahead and go out and fluoro. You're going to fluoro exactly to where you want. The doctor's going to set the field size once she's determined exactly how big she wants the field and all of those things. You're going to then notate everything because we're going to assume this is like just a basic ABPA lung, including the vertical because we have everything pretty much set. When you come into the room, you're going to go ahead and mark the CR. Now that you have the CR, this is a particular case where we kind of want to know what mid-plane is. We're not going to wait until the end to take our calipers and get a separation. We're going to, since we have everything set, we're going to go ahead and get a separation here. Hopefully your patient will move. If they do, you have to refloor or everything. Let's get a mid-plane separation, calculate the SSD. We're great. The next thing you want to do, that we've got a separation and we've set our correct SSD, is determine our dose points. It's four possible do dose points on a lung. Your CR, your lower mediastinal, the lower mediastinal is one to two centimeters, sometimes three centimeters, superior to the inferior edge of your field. Upper mediastinal, which is about halfway between the superior field edge and your CR. Your CR counts as one, so that's three. 
and your supraclavicular. If your field is large enough to be at the supraclav, it's pretty thin up in here, and if they want to actually treat the supraclavicular area and get dose in there, you're gonna have a dose point up in there as well. So that's four possible dose points. CR, lower mediastinal, upper mediastinal, and supraclav. Now we've got all our dose points marked. What you want to do is not necessarily mark these like I did, that was just for your information. You're actually going to put BBs or some other type of marker at each one of these three points other than the CR. The CR is naturally marked with the crosshair. So you're going to put BBs at all these other marks. Once you have your BBs placed, take your film. Get it approved. Once your film is approved, you're almost there. You want to then come back in, rotate around, and take a PA film as well. That seems redundant on the APPA uh, uh, treatment, but guess what? Your spinal cord is this much further away from your CR, from the AP, than it is from the PA. Your spinal cord is going to project differently. It's going to actually physically look like it's a different size when you take an AP than it does when you take a PA. So you need both of those films in order to demonstrate which one's AP, which one's PA, and exactly what everything projects and looks like when you're comparing a port film to your DRR. So remember, since your spine is so posterior, it's going to project differently because your divergence is such from the AP that it's going to look different from the PA. Your divergence is coming in and hitting your spine well before it ever gets to it from the AP. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Either way, you need to take two films because of divergence and because of projection of the spinal cord. Once you have those done, rotate back up. Once you rotate back up, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to actually physically unlock your table and you're going to move the CR to each dose point. At that dose point, you're going to notate the SSD. In this case, it's 91. You're then going to move your table to your next dose point. 93.2. Move your table to the next dose point. It's about 96 and a half. Now you've got all four dose points because you notated your SSD that you calculated and set for your CR. So you have four SSDs. Now we need to have a separation at all four of these points. You're going to get your caliper in. Now that we're done with everything, one thing I forgot, before you move your patient, give yourself a three-point setup. Can't believe I forgot that. Before you move your patient, get a three-point setup going so you can reproduce your patient. Very important. Now, we've got all our marks on our patients. Patient, we've got a three-point setup. We've got SSDs at all of our nose points. Get your caliper in, and you're going to take separations at each place that you've got a dose point. So you're going to have four SSDs, four separations. You do your calipers last, as we've discussed in previous classes, because you're likely to move your patient when you're trying to get that caliper up underneath them four times. They're likely to lift up and move around. Try to save that till last. We did take that one separation early on so that we can get our mid plane. And that's fine. You may have to redo some of the flooring if you do that. That's the biggest thing for your lung. Now, what's different about a mantle from a lung? Almost all of these same things are going to take place, except the field is going to be much larger. It's going to be up on the patient superiorly from where you are now and you are going to have the arms down instead of up. The patient is actually going to be akimbo. Now, I can't demonstrate akimbo on her, but I can demonstrate it on myself. What you have, just think Superman. You're going to have the fingers tucked kind of behind the hips. The arms are going to be out. It's going to open up the axillary area. 
it's going to cause you to be able to treat that axillary area because you've got lymph nodes in the axilla that need to be treated with a mantle. You're treating lymph node chains. You're going to treat all the way up to the submandibulars, cervical, mediastinal, supraclav, and axillary lymph node chain, all the way down to the, to the diaphragm. So, you have the person akimbo, the arms are kind of be at their sides, elbows kicked out, and you're going to kick the chin up as far as you possibly can, almost to the point that they're uncomfortable. You're going to have, we're going to get a D headrest out of her. She can actually achieve a D headrest. I don't break all of my stuff first. So in her particular case, it's going to be something like that. Chin way the heck up. Now, this, a lot of times you're going to go ahead and make a mask. What that's going to do is you're going to have a mask and it's going to hold the chin in the same place. You're going to have the head rotation and the head tilt exactly the same every day with a mask. And then you'll be able to put a mark on the mask instead of trying to tattoo their chin. Back in the 90s when I learned how to do this, we didn't use a mask. We take, the, take their chin up and we put a tattoo on their chin. So they had a nice tattoo for the rest of their lives. At least they got to live. So, our ballpark is going to be a little bit different. You're going to be at or just below the SSN as your CR. You're going to open up the field link so that you're down to about the xiphoid inferiorly. And superiorly, you're going to be at about the tip of the chin. What that's going to do is the divergence, which you can see very nicely here how the divergence is angling this way. You're going to be going underneath the mandible, get those submandibular uh, lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes, supraclavicular. Oh wait, look at this, we need to make it wider as well. Field width is going to be out way wide. This one's going to be over 30 centimeters. We've almost got a 40 by 40 set for her. And that's not unusual. A really big field size. So we've got all the way up to the chin, all the way down to the xiphoid. CR is just below the SSN. Chin is kicked away up. She's in an akimbo position. The big difference other than that is we are going to have two additional dose points. You're going to have your CR, just like before. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Lower mediastinal. Now, upper mediastinal on this particular case, it's going to be more of a neck dose point. That's fine. Supraclavicular. Cervical and axillary. So two additionals. So you got your CR, lower mediastinal, upper mediastinal, supraclav, and cervical and axillary. We want to know the dose at those two points as well. Since we're trying to treat the cervical nodes and we're trying to treat the axillary nodes and they're way far away from the CR. The last thing that's a little bit different, let's go ahead I'll walk through this. Um, once you've got the person ballparked, you've got the mask on, you've got the chin up, you've got a akimbo, you kind of take a separation right here where you think it should be, and you've got a sediment plane. Go fluoro. Once you fluoroed, you're going to call the doctor. She's going to come in, she's going to say, hey, you were off by a centimeter, I'm going to move it a little bit, she's going to do some tweaking. Then you're good. Notate everything. If you move in and out very much, your separation could change, so you may need to recalculate calculate your mid-plane SSD. We're going to assume we're good. Come back in, mark your CR. Once you've marked your CR, you also have something else to contend with. Since your arms aren't up and locked in position, since you're akimbo, you've got a lot of movement that can occur. You can have the patient lay like this one day, like this one day, 
but like this one day, we need to have marks out here toward the patient's shoulders so that you know where the shoulder rotation is versus the CR. You're going to put marks way out here on the lateral. You're essentially going to have a one, two, three, four, five point setup with laterals, so it's a six, seven point setup. But you're going to go ahead and you're either going to put a tattoo here or a slash so that you can get this, this, and this all three in line together. And you're going to get this, this, and this in line together. And you're going to have them rotated correctly. So you're going to have a lot of manipulation, but you're going to give your therapist all the tools possible from this sim to get them lined up. You're going to have, give them something to rotate to, something to line up in three-point inline setup here and three-point inline setup here as well. You're going to be kind of doing a four, four corners. If anybody's played basketball, you're going to run the four corners here as well as the CR. That assures us that these axillary nodes are in the same place every day because what's going to actually happen whenever the person has their field blocking done, they're going to have humeral head blocks. They're going to have lung blocks. They're going to have a mouth block. And if you have any of that off, you're going to block critical areas and have critical areas that are supposed to be blocked unblocked if you don't have them lined up properly. As we know, if the person's arms are at their sides, even if it is a chemo, heads are going to be blocked, you're going to have lung blocking, and you're going to have to fit everything in between. I said that we would have a mask. You can also have a long mask that would hold the shoulders in place more accurately and more reproducibly than just a mask to hold the chin in place. So you can have a long mask, you can have a short mask, you can have no mask at all. All of those are valid, but either way you need to make sure that you're able to get the shoulders into the same place in the same way every day. So as we know, that is going to be difficult sometimes. So either way you do it, that's fine, but we still have to have all of these dose points on. Just like with the lung, you're going to put BBs on all seven points and then take your film. Once you've taken your film and gotten it approved, you're good to go. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to unlock the table, move the patient around, read an SSD at all of those points without ever moving the table up down. I think I did not mention that on the lung, but I mentioned it in class. Don't move your table up down. Only unlock your table and move your table around. Once you've gotten all of the SSDs at this plane, then go back in with your calipers take separations at every one of those points and write those down alongside your SSD readings. Now that you've done that, you've got all seven marks and all of your dose points and everything that you need. Take your photographs. Do your permanent marks if you're going to. All the normal photographs that you normally do. And then educate your patient and invite them back for treatment later on. So that's for mantle and for lung.